um, I will get started. So thank you everyone for joining. My name is Brianna Marbury and I am the executive director of the Interledger Foundation where we help spread the message that, hey, we can make sending payments as easy as sending email with our open source currency network, the Interledger Protocol. We also aim to bring more diverse voices into the tech ecosystem as builders and entrepreneurs. COIL has graciously allowed me to take over their Twitter spaces today to talk to a very special guest, uh, Costa Peric, who is the Deputy Director of Financial Services for the Poor at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And he is also one of our board members at the Interledger Foundation. Costa, I'm so excited to talk to you today. Um, thank you so much for agreeing to have this conversation with me. Thank you so much, Brianna, for having me. And uh, let's uh, put our heads together on inventing the future of payments. <laughs> it sounds good. And I, I'm really excited about this talk because I feel like every time I have a conversation with you, um, you always drop little gems and that are just so helpful in this space. Um, can you tell us, start off by telling us a little bit about um, yourself and your background? Uh, okay. So I'm a little bit of a world citizen. I was born in Serbia. I spent all my teenage years in Africa and Burundi. I uh, studied computer science in Belgium and stayed uh, quite a while in Belgium, married a Belgian, and uh, worked at uh, quite a long career at Swift, and then joined the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in Seattle uh, nine years ago. Uh, I kind of thrive at the intersection of finance, technology, and innovation, and I was lucky and privileged to have participated in some quite big projects at Swift. I was the chief architect for the network that is currently running. Uh, at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, we are driving you know, this effort of um, uh, providing digital payment and identity platforms for the 1 billion, 200 million people still uh, uh, being unbanked and unconnected to the financial system of the planet. So that's quite a huge project. So that's mm -hmm. kind of a very brief overview of who I am and what I do. Oh, wow. I, so I just learned something new about you today, too. See, uh, very interesting. So you were working at Swift for a long time, and, and I feel like you're very modest in that you were one of the chief architects of what a lot of people use today um, to make payments. So why did you make the switch from working at Swift to focusing on financial inclusion and services uh, for the poor? Um, really, uh, it started as a curiosity. Um, at Swift, one of the things also I, I did was to co-create and run Inno Tribe, which was kind of like the innovation and incubation arm of Swift, um, still active today as well. Uh, and uh, the idea there was to kind of co-create with the member banks of Swift some uh, ideas. And the subject of financial inclusion came about uh, in a kind of a almost a uh, shaming way for all this industry because back at, back then there was more than 3 billion people that were mm -hmm. unbanked on the planet. Mm -hmm. And I kind of discovered this like a ton of bricks for, <laughs> fell on me <laughs> when I understood the, uh, the, the size of the issue and started learning and connecting with people. And then really I became passionate about it and eventually you know, the stars aligned and the Gates Foundation was looking for a kind of pay payment and technology expert to help them out in creating this new strategy mm -hmm. uh, that is called Financial Services for the Poor and proposed to join. And I gladly accepted. It was a very good moment and time. And we moved to 
Seattle and uh, I'm uh, and I kind of I helped put together this strategy uh, early on uh, that really was focused and is still focused on uh, providing digital payment platforms and identity platforms. So it's it's a curious. It started as a curiosity, then it's kind of, it was like a huge surprise, and then it became a passion, and now almost like a like a, uh, you know, like the only thing I do. <laughs> yeah, I, I can I can totally relate to that. Um, I, I I kind of ended up landed in this area too, not knowing about the the larger problem that's going on in the world. But but from my own experiences, having seen like what some of the financial access issues are, so. Um, yeah, I'm relatively new in compared to you to this field, but I can definitely mm -hmm. see how it, it, it has become a passion of mine. Um, yeah. So you've worked on so many different projects that are just doing so well. What are you working on right now that are, you're most excited about? There are two things. Um, so right now what we are working on is uh, scaling uh, the this concept of instant payment platforms at the infrastructure, really at the country or even regional level, in many countries in Africa, South Asia, uh, South America. So we're we're essentially scaling this concept because we know it works. Um, you know, to give you a recent example, in Pakistan there is such. Uh, a payment platform that's called Rust that we have helped the Central Bank of Pakistan create and that is an interoperable instant payment platform, really uh, the best you can make, uh, the, the state of the art, and that can connect up to 200 million people. And so that that's what we are working on. The excitement comes with the fact that uh, there is much more to be done uh, in this scaling, I, I'm just back from India, uh, where I went around and surveyed, you know, the inimaginable scale that they achieved in providing more than a billion people with a digital identity, and you know, doing uh, right now the UPI instant payment system in India is processing in excess of six billion transactions per month. So it's really mind-blowing, the, the scaling that can be achieved. Um, and we'll talk later about how to replicate that scale elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that really gets me thinking and excited in terms of innovation are the form factors. When I went in India on the ground, you can see how, however successful this is today, it's still a little cumbersome. You know, you fill with phones, you scan QR codes, not everything is the local language of the people that they understand. So there is still this struggle with the form factor. And I think there is a lot of innovation coming on, on, on you know, moving off maybe from this mobile phone that is kind of like the uh, Swiss knife of, thing, of digital to, to maybe more specialized uh, devices that can be much more helpful in helping, you know, illiterate people, you know, uh, drive through this complexity of digitization going forward. So, so I can see some early glimpses of people, very bright people thinking about these new form factors. And I'm really excited about that. Okay, very cool. So one, one great thing that you are involved in is Interledger. <laughs> so <Yes. laughs> how, how did that come about? How did you learn about Interledger? And why is that something that you continue to um, be excited and involved in? Yeah, so it's, it's, it goes back to one very memorable afternoon in San Francisco where I met Stefan and Ivan and their team, uh, who I knew before, but I kind of came to, to them who were working at Ripple to ask them about a problem I was having and that I knew they could do something with uh, and about, 
which is this basic interoperability of platforms. Um, as we were thinking about setting up this strategy at the Gates Foundation focused on digital payment platforms, you know, the, the basic problem to be solved is interoperability. There are so many systems that grew in silos and that, uh, you know, you need to interconnect in a safe way and in a way that is uh, that provides certainty. And so I kind of, it, it, you know, serendipity has it. They were working on what will become, what became Interledger. And that memorable afternoon, we have a kind of a meeting of the minds where, where I met a potential solution for the problem I was looking. They, I think, met a new use case um, that they got interested in. And, and eventually, uh, I went on at the Gates Foundation to create Moja Loop, about which we will talk a little bit about, uh, I'm sure, which is an open source system that allows people to create digital payment platforms easily. And Stefan and Evan went to create the, what will become the Interledger protocol. But today, Mojadoop actually uses the Interledger protocol as a key component. And that's why I'm very interested in, Inter in Interledger. I participate, as you mentioned, to the board of the Interledger Foundation. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's how it all fits together. Okay. Um... Well, maybe one thing that you can clear up for the people that are listening, I noticed in our, our latest call for proposals that we had, a lot of people kind of didn't really know the difference between Moja Loop and Interledger. Uh, so could you explain to people yeah. what the difference is? Yes, I, and I'll try to be not too technical uh, because we can <laughs> <laughs> we can get technical very fast. Uh, but, yeah. So essentially... Um, what what the problem that Moja Loop tra uh, is solving is that a person uh, with her mobile phone can send instantaneously a payment to another person uh, on another mobile phone or bank account, whatever they have, instantaneously and across providers. So, uh, you know, if you have a system a payment system where uh, where all the provide there is only one provider then obviously <laughs> there is no problem of interoperability but then you there is a big silo everyone has to be connected to the same provider that doesn't work in practice so we have to interconnect providers so the what we aim to achieve is this instant payment across providers that's what moja loop provides of course other commercial providers provide that mojo loop is an open source uh, system, uh, system that en enables to do this now in order for this to work for the poor the poorest uh, the system has to have certain characteristics notably instantaneous irrevocable payments it has to mimic cash um, and also it has to essentially be certain uh, when the payment is made, um, then it's made. There is no way to, uh, to undo it. And then also it's very important for the person who pays to know the conditions of the payment. Uh, so, um, you know, what are the fees, uh, you know, how, uh, and eventually who they are sending the payment to before they send it, so that they are certain of the outcome. So Moja Loop does all of that. In this, uh, in this function, the part that has to do with actually affecting the payment and moving the money from one provider's uh, account to another provider's account is what Interledger does. Moja Loop has other characteristics like uh, this exploration in advance of the transaction to find out who, what is the name of the person that you're sending the money to, what are all the fees that apply, um, you know, and then also the more complex issue of inter-provider settlement that does not happen in real time in most of the countries. So Mojo does all of that. The part that Interledger does is this connectivity and providing certainty that the money has moved. 
Okay. All right. So what problems um, do you think Interledger can solve um, in both the near term and long term um, mm-hmm. trajectories? So, so Interledger is, um, you know, I uh, and Stefan loves to use this metaphor, and I really also like the metaphor that Interledger, you can look at it a little bit like um, a protocol on the internet. Good examples are TCP IP or perhaps SMTP for email. These are open protocols that enable interoperability between disparate systems. And so Interledger is that for payments. So that's, that's kind of the basic value proposition of, of, of that. What is interesting in the long term is this notion of connecting ledgers. And so if I look at it from a very, like we paint this big picture. So for example, in the wholesale payment world, we mentioned there is Swift doing the bank to bank payments. So Swift does the interoperability for wholesale payments. Mm -hmm. In the retail side, we are working Moja Loop and Interledger and Gates Foundation and the Interledger Foundation on providing these uh, instant payment platforms that are inclusive and serve the poor. I think there is another world ahead of us that we haven't yet uncovered, which is the world of Pico or nano payments that is the world of machine-to-machine payments uh, or the word, w- world of, you know, having a huge amount of very small amount transactions um, in the future. And so these three worlds need, will need to be interconnected and Interledger is the perfect protocol to do that interconnection, not only about ledgers, but these big meta ledgers, meta planets really of payments that today don't talk at all to each other. So going all from the Pico payment of 0.0001 cent to the mega, you know, the, the, the trillion dollar payment that goes on, on Swift occasionally. So that's, that's where the interledger long-term value in my mind is, is connecting these worlds together. Yes, I, I definitely agree. And I, I find that people often uh, find it difficult to conceptualize exactly the possibilities of what the interledger protocol is. And they often confuse the network with being a blockchain, which it's not. I try to yeah. tell people, mm-hmm. you know, because it's currency agnostic, meaning it can move any types of funds, including um, having the ability to transfer crypto from one blockchain to another. Mm-hmm. So in thinking about financial inclusion, what role, um, if any, do you see cryptocurrency playing when it comes to payments and financial inclusion? Yeah. So the, no role and a role let me explain <laughs> so the, <laughs> okay. the crypto the cryptocurrencies i think are li- very little helpful in financial inclusion because the way the cryptocurrencies are today like bitcoin ethereum uh, and the others uh, solve only a fraction of the problem uh, that needs to be solved and do not solve it very well so they solve the problem of transmitting value, but they don't solve it very well because very rarely the payment is instantaneous, as we know, um, and uh, there are lots of fees and lots of uh, mm-hmm. churn and lots of friction. Uh, and, you know, the, the good news is that the community is very aware. We just lived through the reboot of uh, Ethereum uh, on proof of stake. So all of there is a lot of work being done. But right now, the way cryptocurrencies are, they solve only a fraction of the problem, not very well. To give you an example of other things they don't do, uh, but which is very relevant and required is, um, you know, cashing in and cashing out of crypto. Because um, mm. 
cash is very much still king in many countries. There is no, and, and so um, uh, if a person receives a, a crypto, you know, some crypto value, and they now have to work and pay for this to, you know, cash it out, um, that, that doesn't work. Uh, what cashing out needs to be, you know, you, you need to go in a marketplace, in a shop, where you know the typical agent will hand you cash, re- remove uh, remove the value from the wallet, and be done. And this is all very very cheap. So cryptocurrencies actually do not even conceptualize these problems. And so that's kind of point one. Though, and that's the second part of the answer. I I do think that the crypto space has a lot to offer uh, to the future of financial inclusion, notably on the cryptology, the crypto side itself, and the decentralization side, uh, essentially underlying the blockchain. Um, Mm -hmm. An interesting example of that is what's happening with the CBDCs. Um, And I'm not talking about retail CBDCs. I see the value of CBDCs mostly to be behind the scenes to to enable a country to have a financial resilience by by having a decentralized payment platform rather than a centralized one, which is subject to hacking and, you know, uh, loss of control. That that part is promising. And, uh, you know, I I mentioned this, I think, to you and to Stefan, one part of exciting part of my job is to kind of like ch- understand all this technology and cherry pick what we need to solve the financial inclusion problem. So there are lots of components in the crypto space that make sense, but the cryptocurrencies themselves do not. Yeah. Okay. And and just for those who are listening who don't know what CBDCs are, that's uh, central bank digital currencies where we're looking at, uh, where some central banks around the world are looking at um, creating a digital currency of their own. And, and what Costa meant by retail is um, going directly from the bank to um, a consumer versus going from a central bank to a commercial bank, which would be a wholesale CBDC. Um, so not too long ago, the, the World Bank released its global Findex report that showed in 2021, people engaging with the financial, ser- engaging with financial services has gone up considerably. And I like to think that part of all of the work that you're doing has helped to contribute to that. Mm-hmm. In the U.S., uh, there's talks of a big recession coming, with some saying that we're, in fact, already in the beginnings of it. Um, from your experience, how has that affected people's attitudes towards mm. innovation and experimentation in the space during times of uncertainty? Uh, in a couple of very important ways. One important way is that uh, even before the current recession, the covid has actually accelerated considerably um, the part of digitization of payments. Why? Because many, many governments um, wanted to provide help in the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, cash, you know, subsidies and help to their people and citizens. And, you know, doing that in cash is very inefficient and leakage prone. So we have seen a huge acceleration of uh, the deployment of payment platforms to deliver what we call in our jargon G2P, government-to-person payments, typically subsidies. So so the the pandemic has had a huge booster effect on on the financial inclusion in particular by uh, including more people into the digital space to be able to receive these digital payments. So that's kind of one. And I, I see the current headwinds in the economy to be a bit about the same. Uh, while everyone suffers from inflation and, you know, the adverse uh, cost increases and so on, at the same time, uh, 
people do need to participate more in the economy to make up for lost revenue and make up for, uh, you know, I- increasing prices. And again, being able to participate in, a, in the economy in a g- digital way is a huge booster. So actually we see, again, an increase of activity in many countries. Um, U.S. is a special case, which we can talk about, but in many other countries uh, across the planet. The, the adverse effect that the headwinds, uh, economic headwinds have on our work is the, the fact that the development aid money from many countries is uh, drying up. Uh, in favor of other uh, priorities, you know, like the war, um, uh, like, uh, again, helping their own citizens first and, you know, and the refugees. And so uh, the challenge we have now is to keep the momentum in terms of funding these efforts, because funding one problem with digital platforms on a country, you know, and digital public infrastructure is that it re- does require funding and many countries don't necessarily have that funding. So, so that's, that's the challenge we are facing now. Okay. Um, so since all of these new um, solutions have popped up since the COVID has started, what are some of the like, favorite new products and startups that you see uh, that are making waves in the financial sector? Um, on the macro side, uh, definitely there is this notion of digital public goods, uh, this notion that we do need digital infrastructures of payments, identity, data sharing and consent, uh, and others to be available Um I'm I'm heading to Estonia next week uh, uh, to talk to some people, be, and we all know that Estonia is a kind of pioneer. We can see some of the benefits of digitizing uh, the government, even the government uh, there. To to be able to do that, these DPGs, digital public goods, open source uh, systems like I mentioned, Mojadu for payments, Interledger protocol for uh, transferring payments uh, and others are very important because they allow other countries to follow pioneers, not make the same mistakes, lower their costs, and increase their adoption speed of this digital infrastructure. So that's one macro level trend that I can see. Some people talk about GovStack, you know, the government. Uh, software stack to provide all of these uh, services in addition to payments and identity and so on. So that that's kind of like one huge um, uh, macro level view. I think the other uh, innovation space uh, has to do with uh, with these additional products beyond payments. So once these platforms are up. Now we have the opportunity for a huge innovation uh, on top of these platforms because then apps can see, you know, various app, new apps can benefit and not worry about, you know, setting up a payment and identity infrastructure. That's how we see in India this exponential amount of payments done by all these new apps that people are putting together and uh, based on, on new customer needs. So these, these, you know, these billions of new customers coming into the system with their own needs, we see a huge innovation space opening for fintechs and, uh, you know, other products to, to, um, to come in. To name a few examples, insurance for the poor, it's a totally different business than the insurance that, uh, you know, uh, for the for the top of the pyramid or middle of the pyramid people, it's a completely different product that relies mostly on the availability of big data to be able to uh, to do the claim. So just one example of how a totally new business segment can be opened uh, with with this huge new uh, customer population coming coming online. Yeah, 
Wow. Um, and even with all of these new innovative products coming on, um, what are some of the biggest challenges you see for smaller startups mm -hmm. trying to come into this yeah. space? Yeah, so let me put my veteran hat. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I'm sure Stefan is laughing. Um, so one thing that we have lost, uh, and I'm old enough to remember, you know, when I started my, my um, uh, you know, my career, that you could not send an email outside of your company. I, I vividly remember that. I lived through that. I'm old enough to have lived through that. <laughs> and now we don't, we don't even think about it. And no, I think, not at all. I think the challenge we have is to kind of revive this spirit that was prevalent then, that, that became, that's what pushed the whole uh, community to, to, to invent the internet that we know now. This notion that to better compete, you need to collaborate some. This notion that there is no, there is no benefit in, in uh, you know, creating silosis that, you know, to serve a particular need, that you do need to work with your sometimes competitors to create an infrastructure so that you all can thrive together. That's kind of the, we have lost this. Today, you know, uh, and it's understandable, it's very human. Uh, you know, every tech, fintech CEO wants her, you know, fintech to become the next unicorn, right? And in order to do that, sometimes they create a silo that uh, only people can use, you know, who subscribe to their platform. And so we have this multitude of platforms and now we have to sit down and, and, and interconnect them together. So, so yeah, I, it's kind of a little bit like a rant. I'm, I'm, I'm no, really, no, no. I'm really uh, like pushing people to think about the best way to organize, to provide, to work together on providing the, these digital public infrastructures so that on top of that, you can create this infinite um, innovation space and that's what we saw with internet that's how internet evolved um and that's that's where you know and of course internet went through several stages and now we are with considering web 3.0 but in fact web 3.0 is exactly what i'm talking about is again mm -hmm. the notion of 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 having a digital infrastructure that can sustain this new type of applications that we are coming so my my plea <laughs> <laughs> to the fintech entrepreneurs is to like collaborate some to compete better. It's very abstract, I know, but it's really important to build together this infrastructure um, and also not only for them to thrive, but also for all the people of the planet to thrive. Yes, uh, collaboration is definitely needed. One one company, one person cannot solve all of these like yes. big issues that yes. you're trying to solve. And yes. so you have to have partners in this space, yes. definitely. Yes. yes, absolutely. But it's hard. I know. I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so just the, the last question that I have for you, um, we are in our early days. The Interledger Foundation has only been in operation a little bit over two years now. Um, and where do you, from you sitting on your board seat, where do you see us going and, and having an impact in five or 10 years from now? Yeah, um, I, I think um, there are two, two, uh, two types of, of advice, two, two, uh, two really uh, advices that I can give as a board member. One is that Interledger has this property characteristic, key characteristic of being a component of bigger solutions. So look for other uh, use cases and solutions that need Interledger and embed Interledger into their solutions. The use case of Mojadoop is a great example, uh, but there are others. So that's one 
kind of embedding uh, the technology, like an enabling part of Interledger. The other is what Interledger will enable. And let me come back to this point of nano and PICO payments, which I think is something that Interledger can open. And let me give you an example of what I have in mind, actually. Uh, you know, there, there are examples in Africa. Uh, Africa suffers in the eastern part of the continent of these very frequent locusts invasion coming from the north. And these locusts basically eat everything in their, in their path. Um, it's, a huge, mm -hmm. it's a huge problem. Um, and there are many, one of the challenges is to identify where the locust cloud is so that, you know, you can combat it, you can, you can mm -hmm. go ahead and fight it. So imagine that someone on the ground there spots a locust cloud, takes a picture uh, of the cloud uh, and geolocates through uh, her phone where she is sends that information to whomever is in charge and in, in exchange of that receives a very small payment. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a good example of how, you know, we can, you, we can push this notion, uh, kind of like a gig worker notion to the square of making new revenue streams for people based on these very small services that they can provide but on a very numerous very numerous times that's kind of one one uh, case of uh, nano payments the other of course is all the machine to machine payments which will become huge as well in the future and i think personally that interledger has the i think is well positioned to open that door with other partners and explore that uh, in the in the few months and years to come. But I would advise that this is one bet to take and explore and invest in, uh, uh, and and uh, possibly it will become the not the next, you know, innovation space ahead. Yeah, very very innovative thoughts indeed. And why I enjoy having you so much on our board. And I want to thank you, Costa, for taking your time to talk with me today. I, I could talk to you for hours. Um, and <laughs> yes. I would like to thank everyone else for joining. And I want to remind you that Interledger is having a summit in New Orleans next yes. month. Yes. Um, November 11th, the, the evening of November 11th, we have a demo day. And then uh, Costa will be there. Stefan yes. will be there. I will be there. And um, follow Interledger Twitter account to stay up to date and register. And please come join us. We would love to have you there. Thank you all so much. And thank you, Costa, thank uh, you. for my first Twitter space talk. <laughs> 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 and we'll talk to you all soon. Thank you, Brianna. And to all who are listening, please do follow Brianna because she's forging the path. She's clearing the path to the next innovation in payments. So be on the lookout for her. 